Hi, I'm Dustin Abbott, and I'm here to give you my second review in the series of the Samyang VAF lenses. So at this point, there are three lenses that have been released with the promise of two more to come in the series. Previously released lenses are the 24 millimeter, 35 millimeter, and 75 millimeter T1.9 lenses. And you can see my overview video that covers the shared features and design uh, in this video here. Still to come are a 45 millimeter along with a 20 millimeter T1.9 lenses. Today we're looking at the 35 millimeter T1.9. Now, if you're not familiar with the concept of the Samyang VAF series, these lenses are hybrid lenses that recognize that many modern photographers are hybrid shooters and that most modern mirrorless cameras are almost equally as adept as video recording devices as they are for capturing stills or photos. And so as a recognition of that, the Samyang VAF series allows you to have a lot of cine lens type features and lenses that also have autofocus and can behave pretty much like normal um, photo lenses as well. And so they are really, really handy for a lot of different things. And the more that I have used this series, the more that I appreciate some of the subtle aspects that I'm discovering of design. And so we're going to be doing that second review in this series where we're going to look deeply at the 35mm T1.9 right after a word from our sponsor. Are you ready to use that gear and show off your skills? Viltrox is sponsoring a global photo contest with more than $15,000 worth of prizes with one catch. Photos must be shot with a Viltrox lens. A panelist of judges from around the world, including my friend Christopher Frost, will select the winners. The contest runs from April 10th to June 10th, and you can upload your submissions to the link in the description below. First prize comes with over $4,000 worth of gear, including a Fujifilm X-T5 and a Viltrox AF 13mm f1.4 lens, with subsequent prizes loaded with lenses, tripods, lights, swag, and gift cards. There is no cost to enter, so get snapping, upload your best work, and win big prizes in the Viltrox Global Photo Contest. So you may have noticed my reference to T1.9, and that is one of the aspects of a cine lens that is incorporated here. As while photo lenses are typically designated by their maximum f-stop or aperture size, which would correspond to f1.8 in the tiny series that these lenses are based off of. But in the case of cine lenses, it is looking at the light transmission. And so while you might have a physical aperture of f1.8, which we do here, it measures the amount of light that actually reaches the sensor. And typically by the time you get through the optical path, the various glass elements that make up that optical design, there's a little bit of loss of light in the process. In this case, it's not all that significant. And so an f1.8 lens has a T stop of T1.9, which is quite efficient by lens design standards. But what's important here is that we have a consistency of T1.9 across all of the lenses, which means that as you switch hot swap one lens for another, your settings are able to stay the exact same because the same amount of light is going to reach the sensor. This is all about standardization in this lineup. And so we see that all of them are the exact same size. They have the exact same feature set. They're designed to handle even when it comes down to the focus ring to where the feel is going to be identical across the series. So to look at those dimensions, this lens, all of these lenses are 72.2 millimeters or 2.84 inches in diameter. They are 72.1 millimeters or 2.84 inches long. And they all have a 58 millimeter front filter filter thread, they all weigh exactly 280 grams or 9.6 ounces. All of them share common design of all the features here, and so that includes this metal front of the lens. It includes a metal bayonet style, uh, style ring at the front of the lens that allows you to mount on accessories like this manual fo focus accessory that we'll get to in just a moment. What's interesting is there's not just a bayonet mount, but much like the, the mount at the rear of the lens, there is also electronic contacts that is going to allow pass-through of information. And so when you have an accessory like this mounted on there, you're going to continue to have electronic communication throughout, which is really unique in its overall design. As a part of the design, we have tally lamps at both the front of the lens and the side of the lens. And so that allows you to evaluate recording um, either from the front or from the side. You can control and tweak the behavior of how the tally lamps function by using the Samyang lens station. That runs you anywhere between 30 and $50, depending upon the sale 
price, but I highly recommend getting it because it allows you to do firmware updates. It allows you to tweak the behavior of the lens in a in more ways than ever before with these VAF lenses. So it's certainly worth having. I do have a video on how that all works and how to do firmware updates if you want to check that out here. Also included in the design is that we have a focus hold button and then we have a custom switch. Custom switch with two positions and it allows you to tweak the behavior of the ring here depending upon what position you're in. So for me, I like to put have the first custom position to function as an aperture ring, which is useful not only for stills but also for aperture racking when doing video. In the second custom position, I like to have that set up to where you automatically go right into manual focus mode and so you can use the ring for manual focus at that point. All of these share a six weather sealing points throughout the lens, so starting at the rear gasket and then seal points throughout, giving you a nice thoroughly sealed design, which can be useful when the weather turns inclement. Now, because of that front bayonet mount, all of these lenses are not designed to be used with a lens hood. And so fortunately, the front element is a little bit recessed in all of them. And so far I've found, as we're going to see in this review, that the flare resistance is really quite good even without that, um, without that lens hood incorporated. We also have an aperture iris that is made of nine aperture blades and as you can see here it does a reasonably good job of retaining a circular shape. We also see that there is a kind of a hybrid approach to the aperture control and that when you are in stills mode, as you can see, there are some visible steps approximating f-stops as you go down. However, if you switch into video mode, you get a smoother racking experience that functions more like a clickless experience and allows you to get better aperture racks than what you would if the lens or the aperture was designed otherwise. It's one of those subtle touches that I picked up on after a while that just shows the thought that's gone into making this a true high hybrid experience. There is a linear focus motor that drives autofocus, more on autofocus in just a moment. And we have a minimum focus distance of 0.29 meters, 29 centimeters, and that gives us a maximum magnification of 0.17 times. Certainly not class leading, but right there in the hunt for uh, being about the average of what you're going to see for a 35 millimeter lens. And so while this is a little bit larger than what its tiny series, the 35 millimeter f1.8 was, this lens is just, they're, they're so nicely made. The build quality is so much nicer. And that standardized feature set, of course, is what is going to make these really work. Now, a quick word on the first accessory that has been released for these lenses. Samyang is promising others in the future, but this is a manual focus adapter. And so you might ask, why do we need a manual focus adapter when we already have a good manual focus ring? The short answer to that is really in two different areas. First of all, when you have any kind of mirrorless lens, because it is designed to where input on the focus ring runs through the focus motor, there are no hard stops at either minimum or infinity focus. And also, because of that same issue, you have no distance markings, no distance scale. So while this is a linear manual focus ring with a full 300 degrees of rotation built onto the lens itself, you have no distance markings. Somehow, I'm not even quite sure how they pulled it off, but with this manual focus accessory, you get a few things. First of all, you get distance markings there, so, so giving you even higher, more repeatable results. Those distance markings come in both metric and imperial. You also get hard stops at both infinity and minimum focus, which is going to be incredibly useful. You're also getting a standardized matte box for a, the, this typical 95 millimeter. And the way that this is designed is it's real easy to lock into place and to remove. It's just, it's a quality design and it really works. And so already we have a really nice manual focus experience, but it just goes up to a, a higher degree for repeatability and also just having all of that visual precision right there. I really, really enjoy using that manual focus accessory. It's one of these things that really does help to set this series of lenses apart from the run of the mill lenses that I typically review. So let's talk about autofocus. As noted, we do have that linear focus motor as a part of the design. And what we have got is a lens or a focus motor that's tuned really for, again, two different hybrid functions. So when it comes to 
two stills capturing. Uh, focus is is quick, it's snappy, back and forth, um, with very, very little lag and autofocus, so zero problems there. I found that when I was shooting, for example, this shot of my son at Niagara Falls, even shooting at very, very narrow depth of field and putting a lot of stuff in the foreground, I was able to nail focus on his eye, and I just found in general that I had zero problems with autofocus. Here's a series that follows Ferrari as he moves around and you can see that it stays nice and sticky on the eye as I do that. But when you switch over into video mode, as we saw here, instead of being fast or abrupt, we have a really cinematic tuning. And so in the focus pools, for example, here you can see that they're not rushed, but they're nice and cinematic. But where that really plays out nicely is, say this shot where I'm going along this icy branch. And rather than abrupt uh, focus jumps that are going to draw your eye, you can see that there's really smooth transitions there that allow the, the damping the damping of the focus pulls to look more like they're manually done, manual focus pulls. And so it's just much more artistic. You can see that in some of these other clips here. And so I really, really appreciate what they have done as far as the tuning of the focus motor when it comes to its work for video, because you are getting a more cinematic feel than what I see with most of the autofocus uh, lenses that I typically review. Obviously, this whole series is going to work really well on a gimbal because you've got a great balance of size and weight and obviously the ability to hot swap because they're the exact same size and weight and the balance point is the exact same. So you're not going to have to do any kind of retuning in between. So that obviously is going to be an additional thing that makes this really, really useful. And so in general, I have very, very little to complain about when it comes to the autofocus. I feel like they've just done the various things that they needed to do to make this lens work on both levels. And it does just that. It works great as a photography lens. It works great as a video lens as well. Now talking about the optics, in each one of the things that is standardized across these lenses is that they are, they are making sure that there is a standardization of the actual color, color temperature and color rendering coming off the optical glass. Now that's a huge thing. And as you look across this series, you can see that as I switch between the three lenses that I have right now, that I set a manual white balance. You can see that it's rendering each one of these in an identical way. So that's really, really important for getting consistent color at various focal lengths. And it makes them even more useful as a series, which by the way, as you're going to see, my feeling is, is that these lenses make most sense as a series if you're going to use them in conjunction with other lenses in the series. So some of the strengths, and we'll dive more, kind of do a deep dive in just a moment. Some of the strengths here are obviously that great color and great color accuracy. Um, there is a good cinematic look to both footage and to photography with great color rendition. Bokeh is quite nice for a lens like this. And there's good sharpness, not mind-blowing sharpness, but good sharpness wide open that gets much better as you stop it down. There's minimal amounts of distortion, a manageable amount of vignette, and the weakness tends to be focused on chromatic aberrations. Let's dive in and let's take a look at how that breaks down in my typical optical test. So we'll start by taking a look at vignette and distortion here. So as you can see, there is next to no distortion there, and certainly there is some vignette, but very little to see as far as the distortion front. I was able to get a nice clean correction by just dialing in a plus one, and then you can see as far as the vignette goes, there is a plus 65 that I dialed in. So oh, somewhere between two and two and a half stops of vignette in the corner, so nothing severe here, and uh, everything corrected just fine. We can see here with a lot of straight lines in the shot that even though this is an uncorrected image, you can see that there's no distortion that's really messing things up. And so an easy lens to use where you have straight lines in the scene. The most significant optical flaw that I can find with this 35 millimeter lens is the fact that it does suffer from some longitudinal chromatic aberrations. <laughs> so you can see in these very dirty glasses, um, you can see some purple fringing there. And the most noticeable that you're going to see is the green fringing. So if we look at the video clip of this, you can see some of that fringing show up as we pan throughout this scene. Likewise, if I run back and forth with uh, over my test chart and over straight vertical black black lines, you can definitely see that there is some fringing that will show up. It's not out of control or anything, but it will show up in some of your video clips where it is harder to correct. 
In other scenes, however, with bright lights, the situation like here, this is a situation where a lot of times lenses will show a lot of fringing. You can see that there is a very mild amount of fringing there, but there is nothing uh, that is overly strong here. And as we look towards these bright areas in the background, that is actually handled fairly well. So we have a reasonably balanced uh, result here. Even though it does have some fringing, it's reserved to certain situations. You're going to most see it in bokeh fringing. Now the other form of chromatic aberration, which is lateral chromatic aberrations that show up along the edges of the frame, there is very, very minimal amounts of that as you can see here without any kind of correction. So that's not going to be a significant problem. So here's a look at my test chart where we're going to be using the 50 megapixel Sony Alpha 1 sensor. This is at a 200% magnification I'm showing you here. So you can see in the center of the frame that we have good detail and good contrast. Images are going to have good punch from wide open there in the center of the frame. The mid frame also looks good. Contrast is dropped a little bit, but still looks quite good there in the uh, mid frame. And if we pop down into the corner, we can see that on the, you know, this left hand side of the bill, it actually still looks very good. And as we get towards the very edge, there is a drop off to where contrast is diminishing and the ability to render those fine details is diminished as well. So for some real world perspective, here is an image at f1.8 and we can see here in the center of the frame um, and as we pan across, detail is really, really good. So even wide open, you can get some really great looking shots. And again, it's only at the very edge of the frame where the image quality starts to degrade. Throughout the majority of the frame, it is very sharp even at f1.8. Another example here, f1.8 once again. And we can see again throughout most of the frame uh, that detail looks really really strong and again it's only at the very edge of the frame and in this case you know it's not really the depth of field is not the same so we'll look down here in this corner you can see that we're starting to lose some of that detail throughout a lot of the frame even on a high resolution body though there is plenty of information one final shot here and this is purposely shot to throw a lot out of focus but you can see that in the area that is in focus, that it is very nice and crisp. And I've shown this previously to show accuracy of autofocus, but it just shows how that the optics also keep up with that as well. Now, if we go from f1.8 to f2 on the right, you can see there is a mild uptick in contrast. Image looks a little bit better there. Mid frame, a little bit better. Corner uh, looks a little bit better in terms of contrast. The big jump here, however, comes between f2 and f2.8, where you can see that there is a lot more contrast on tap there. We can see it in the mid frame, which is looking much crisper. And then in the center of the frame, which looks really, really sharp now. At this stage, we'll take a look also at the other side of the frame to see how our centering is showing up. So here on the left side, particularly if you look at the f2.8 where the contrast is already boosted, it's looking really strong there. We move on further here, also looking very, very good. And then we'll pan up to the top of the frame and you can see that at the top as well, that detail is looking good. And so we have a nice amount of centering in the lens as well. So we've already got a lot of resolution as we've seen at f2.8. Stopping on down to f4 just allows a little bit more contrast. We can see that we've got great punch here. Everywhere that we look now, detail is starting to look really good. And we can see we're now starting to resolve well into the corner of the frame as well. Jumping on down to f5.6 gives us a, another boost there as well to where things are looking really, really sharp. So for a real world shot here, we can see that at 100% magnification, which is the way you're actually going to look at things, right down to the trash down there at the edge, everything looks really crisp. Our subjects here, every the detail looks really nice. And we can see rendering into the background, though depth of field is limiting it a little bit, we can see that the lens is resolving really nicely everywhere that we look in the scene. So our minimum aperture here is f22, and as is typical on, particularly on high resolution bodies, diffraction is limiting the image quite a bit. It's actually not as extreme as what I see in many situations, but obviously wide open, you're getting a better result than what you are at f22. So I would recommend here, as usual, about f11 as a limit. You might be able to venture as far as f16 on a lot of bodies, but I wouldn't go any further beyond that. 
Now we've already taken a look at minimum focus distance. I thought you might like a look at how the actual detail holds up up close. I do think that this lens doesn't work quite as well at its minimum focus distance or up close. You can see that contrast is just a little bit lower. It's been reduced. And you're going to find stopping down to f2 and in particular f2.8 is going to increase that resolution as some of the spherical aberrations start to correct. Now the trade-off for both the fringing and also the lower contrast in some situations is that you really can get very nice creamy bokeh that is better than what I see from a lot of 35 millimeter f1.8 lenses. Now the fringing obviously is here and as we've already noted detail up close isn't off the charts so that's probably a usable amount on a high resolution body. But what you can see is your trade-off is that the bokeh really fades off in a very nice and creamy way. We can see as we look at, go back to the geometry here for a moment, you can definitely see that fringing and that is the optical weakness here. And you can see that lemon shape towards the edges of the frame. Stopping down, things start to correct here. And uh, then as we move on, you can get more of a circular shape, but you are starting to see the aperture blades there. But it's in the real world situations where I find that the bokeh is nicer and creamier than what I see from many lenses with a maximum aperture of f1.8 that are around this area. And so uh, in this situation here, you know, you can see the negatives in terms of that kind of cat eye shape, but you can also see that the transition to defocus is actually quite cinematic. And that's what stood out to me as a video kind of focus lens, lens is that a lot of the footage looks really cinematic to me. Here's another shot that, you know, shows that even if you stop down the aperture, the bokeh is still quite nice in this situation. The other thing that stood out to me is that colors are really fantastic and that's true of this whole series but you can see here um, my son against this mural in a restaurant just how the colors just really pop and look really fantastic. Here is obviously a moodier winter scene here with less vibrant colors but you can see that all the detail throughout the frame it looks really really nice and the colors that are captured here in this winter palette are very very pleasing. Another shot here where just the color rendition is really fantastic. And you can see a little bit of the sunburst effect from the rising sun here in this image. This is the worst as far as flare artifacts that I got. And as you can see, it's not with the sun right in the frame, but rather right out of the frame. In fact, if I move to this shot where the sun is right in the frame, there are fewer ghosting artifacts. And you can see that the nine bladed aperture does produce a nice looking sunburst effect. So for the most part, even without having a lens hood, flare resistance is fairly good. There's just a few spots in the frame with the sun or the bright light right out of the frame that you might see a little bit of flare artifacts. So in conclusion, this is a lens that is, it's, it's a little bit of an interesting dichotomy for me because I don't love the amount of chromatic aberration there. And I do find that it's more troubling in video shots because it's harder to correct for. But at the same time, for a lot of other applications, I really love the overall cinematic look of this lens. It, it, in some ways of the three lenses I have right now, it is the most cinematic of the three. And there's something about the overall footage that I just, it really draws my eye and I really appreciate. And so I wish that it had less CA, but I also recognize as a part of optical design that that may be part of what gives it the footage, the look that I enjoy so much. But like the rest of this series, I think that it does a great job of balancing sharpness where you have certainly enough sharpness for just about any kind of application with also that nice rendering. And it also does a great job of straddling both worlds. It's great for photos. It's great for video. And if you look at the series that is designed just for photos in the tiny series, we see that in the VAF series, basically everything is better. We've got a better build, we've got better feature, we've got more mature autofocus, we've got the consistent color, standardized sizes, you've got all of these little video-centric tweaks that are, just end up being useful in real life. And so I, I do appreciate all of these upgrades. And so at the same time, I think the biggest question for many users is going to be, is it worth the extra money over the tiny equivalent? And so in this case, we're looking at, you know, nearly $300 more to go to the VF, VAF version. And I think the answer to that really comes down to two questions. Number one, how much video do you actually do? If you don't do much video, then while you're getting some things that are certainly nicer in the VAF series, they are focused more for those that also want to capture video. And so maybe you can stick with the tiny series if you primarily or exclusively do photography. 
If you do video, however, it's well worth the money. And the second thing I would say it's well worth the money is if you plan on getting more than one of these lenses in the series, because the ability to have that standardization, to do the hot swapping, all these various things that come as a series that really is designed to function as a series, that's where the Samyang VAF series makes a lot of sense. And so the VAF 35 millimeter T1.9, it does have a few flaws, the most exceptional being the chromatic aberration. But at the same time, it has a ton of strengths and it's a lens that I find that I'm just reaching for more and more despite the flaws. I'm Dustin Abbott, and if you look in the description down below, you can find linkage to my full text review, also to my image gallery. There's also linkage or buying links there if you'd like to purchase one for yourself. And beyond that, links to follow myself or Craig on social media, to become a patron, to get channel merchandise. If you haven't already, please like and subscribe. Thanks for watching. Have a great day, and let the light in.